So impingement and cuff pathology, the cuff is in, uh, in an overhead athlete is most susceptible to tensile failure due to eccentric loading during which of the phases of throwing, and Jay went over this uh, showing the five phases of the throwing motion, um, and there you see them, and the answer will be in the deceleration phase of the throwing, and it's during this phase of throwing that the cuff is the principal decelerator of the arm. So an important question that comes up a fair amount. A uh, 47-year-old landscaper presents with worsening left shoulder pain and weakness. And three years ago, he had an injury and treated it non-operatively because he didn't want to miss work. We see this quite often in these overhead laborers. Physical therapy was effective until six months ago when he had a precipitous drop in his shoulder function. His exam now shows decreased range of motion, as shown here, uh, decreased internal rotation, and significant loss of external rotation. Key physical exam findings that Jay pointed out is he has an ER lag sign and a hornblower sign. That's a very bad sign. His belly press and liftoff tests are normal. As Jay told us, that means his subscap is intact. A recent radiograph is shown in figure A, which I'll show you in a moment, and his MRI images are shown in figures B and C, and which would be the best treatment with the five options mentioned. So here you see the plain radiograph in this 47-year-old, which already shows loss of containment of the humeral head with proximal humeral migration, no signs of arthritis. The MRI shows a massive retracted rotator cuff tear, and the sagittal oblique view shows profound atrophy. We'll talk about the classification, but profound atrophy in the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor with a normal subscapularis. So of the treatment options listed when this question was written, the answer would be a latissimus dorsi transfer. Now, if that same question was given today, the answer may well be a superior capsular reconstruction or even perhaps more, um, uh, more possibly a uh, balloon spacer, which is experimental at this point. So probably the, the answer could be uh, different based on when it was written, but at least uh, as written here, a latissimus uh, transfer is the appropriate. Why is that the appropriate answer? Well, it's irreparable, so that takes out answer three. Uh, the patient's failed non-operative management, that takes out option one. A PEC major transfer is a silly answer. It has nothing to do with a posterior superior cuff tear. And a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty in a young 47-year-old la laborer is really a, a, a bad answer. So given those options, a, a latissimus transfer makes the most sense. Jay's done a great job of going over impingement and calcific tendonitis. We're going to focus on cuff tears. We know that cuff tears are extremely common. If we all live long enough, we will all get a rotator cuff tear. If you're over age 70, you have about a 65% chance of having a full thickness tear. And we know that age plays a role with cuff tears, as does smoking. And that also has a big impact on how we counsel patients on whether they're good candidates for rotator cuff repair surgery and what the likelihood of success of that operation may or may not be. Pathophysiology, we know that most tears are degenerative in nature. It's important to remember this. It's the number one question patients ask me and they have a hard time understanding why they could have a massive irreparable tear but not have had any trauma. Chronic impingement, we've talked about the acute avulsion injuries are the things we have to worry about because those are the ones you do not want to miss. Uh, we see this in dislocations. So if you're over age 40 and you have a shoulder dislocation, as you guys all should know, you have a rotator cuff tear until proven otherwise. Iatrogenic injuries usually relate to the subscapularis. So any open procedure that involves a subscapularis takedown, whether it's an open instability, a hemiarthroplasty, a total shoulder arthroplasty, if that patient returns to us postoperatively and has increased passive external rotation compared to the contralateral uninjured side, that's never a good sign. You never want to high five yourself that you did a great job in getting back their motion if they have a, a obvious subscap rupture. So remember that with passive external rotation at the side being a key physical exam finding that Jay mentioned uh, earlier tonight. Associated conditions, AC joint pathology, uh, and then partial thickness rotator cuff tears, which are really important concept. Jay mentioned this as well. 
50% uh, of these asymptomatic tears become symptomatic in two to three years, and 50% of symptomatic full tears progress to bigger tears. So this gives you the whole issue, or brings up the whole issue of how conservative or aggressive should you be in recommending surgical intervention. It should be noted that Jay's group and Ken Yamaguchi and Lisa Gallitz, when they were both at WashU, uh, were really instrumental in understanding the natural history of, uh, of rotator cuff disease, and Jay has carried that torch on really beautifully now uh, for us all to learn from. So uh, we know a lot about the rotator cuff uh, from an anatomy standpoint, and the best way to think about it is the rotator cuff are the horizontal muscles, uh, whereas the deltoid is a vertical muscle. And those, that, those coronal and sagittal plane and axial plane are what keeps the humeral head centered on the glenoid through the uh, full range of motion. And when we lose the rotator cuff, whether it's the anterior or the posterior superior cuff, we start to lose that stable fulcrum. And that's the main focus of rotator cuff arthropathy that we'll talk about. Uh, footprint anatomy and rotator cuff anatomy is critical for us as surgeons, not for just taking tests, but for us as surgeons, because we know that the typical supraspinatus medial lateral insertion is about 13 millimeters, 13 to 14, uh, sometimes up to as high as 16, depending upon the, the body size. So if you see six to seven millimeters of articular surface uncovered in the glenohumeral joint, you now know you're dealing with about a 50% articular sided partial thickness cuff tear. That's critically important because we call that a high-grade tear, and we know that high-grade tears do not respond well to debridement alone if we're thinking about surgery. <coughs> Excuse me. So a high-grade articular side tear uh, may need to be addressed either by taking down the rest of the tissue if you're operating on the patient or performing an insight to repair. But understanding that normal anatomy helps us as surgeons to, to perform the right procedure at the right time. There are five histological areas of the rotator cuff as shown in this slide. I won't go through it all because this is all in your information, but I will point out uh, right here, <coughs> excuse me, that level five is important to understand because that is the shoulder capsule. And we haven't always historically thought about that capsule, but thanks to Miata and Steve Burkhart now popularizing the superior capsular reconstruction, we now have a better understanding of what we might be able to do in some patients with massive irreparable tears. So just something to keep in mind, and this slide helps to remind us about the anatomy and why the SCR procedure does have some uh, um, uh, place in our new armamentarium for massive irreparable cuff tears. The blood supply comes from the subscapular, suprascapular, and humeral circumflex arteries. It's a poorly vascularized uh, tissue, the, the rotator cuff, and we know that the bursal side is more vascular than the articular side, again, with this hypovascular zone being just adjacent to the footprint and this uh, so-called zone of hypovascularity. Some people feel this is controversial, but there's likely a, a vascular component to why we have such a high prevalence of degenerative tears as we go from the fourth through the fifth through the sixth and seventh decades of life. Uh, the rotator interval you saw from uh, Jay is that tissue between, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, supraspinatus and the subscapularis. It's where the capsule, the SGHL, and the coracohumeral or CHL ligaments reside. Um, the rotator crescent is the thin sheet of rotator cuff that comprises the distal portion of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus insertions. And the rotator cable is uh, critically important to function. It's the thick bundle of fibers found in that avascular zone of the CHL running perpendicular to the supraspinatus fibers and spanning the insertion of supra and infra tendons. So these are the terms you'll read a lot about when you're reading about rotator cuff disease and rotator cuff tears. We have lots of classifications, but anatomically we think about the SITS muscles, which we learned back in medical school, and the majority of our tears are going to involve the supraspinatus primarily, and as they get larger, supra and infra, and the example we showed earlier, the teres minor is rarely torn, and that's usually of, of the most massive uh, type. A lot of subscap tears are missed, and it's important for all of the people out there listening to this webinar to make sure you review your MRIs yourself, and especially review your axial images yourself, 
because I can't tell you how many radiology reports and radiology films are missed by uh, non-musculoskeletal radiologists, typically, who are just reading it in uh, some of these uh, radiology dock-in-the-box kind of shops. Uh, so you have to really look for that. And as I've mentioned, uh, any time a subscap has been repaired, you have to be concerned about possible re-tear if there are uh, corresponding physical exam findings. We can also use the North American classification uh, system for cuff tear size, and that's small, medium, large, and massive. And this is popularized by Bob Cofield at Mayo. Uh, Her Harv Elman talked about partial thickness tears, uh, articular bursal or intratendinous, and measuring the size by thickness, as shown here. And then the Goutelier classification, which people don't realize was actually based on CT arthrogram, not on MRI. Uh, but this classification is really important because you're re basically saying how much muscle is left in this patient because if you're contemplating repair, you'd like to be able to know that the muscle actually has a chance to, uh, to function again. So uh, uh, ones are fatty streaking, twos there's more muscle than fat, three there's an equal amount of fat and muscle, and four there's more fat than muscle. And this is again very important and has been uh, highlighted in the European world uh, to contemplate when to not perform a rotator cuff uh, repair versus performing a cuff repair. That is not necessarily agreed upon in North America or in all places in Europe, obviously, but it remains a very uh, controversial and discussed feature at all of our meetings where all of us attend to try to better understand who, who is best served with a cuff repair, with non-operative management, or with some other intervention. <clears throat> we can describe the cuff tears by their shapes, the crescent tears, the U shapes, L shapes, reverse L shapes, whether it's massive and immobile, these are all helpful and these uh, pictures right here uh, show us very nicely uh, what some of these look like. Um, and this is important for understanding as a surgeon, where do I need to repair and what do I need to repair? And for example, if you look at this U shaped tear, well that makes sense, we might want to bring that right over to uh, the footprint and repair it. But if I mistake this um, over here, these chronic tears, then that can leave me in, in big trouble. If I try to take that part of the tendon and move it over to the footprint, that's not going to be an anatomic repair. So understanding the tear pathology is critical to understanding how your repair strategy needs to be employed. And this is something I think that is lost sometimes for early and young arthroscopists uh, and for all of us, as we first started out, understanding the tear so-called so personality is really critical to you being able to do a uh, appropriate rotator cuff repair. Obviously, these patients present with pain. That's the reason they come to us. Uh, night pain is always worse. It's unclear why the bursal, uh, bursitis is worse at nighttime, but there's a number of, uh, of theories on that, but it's certainly been uh, true in my practice over these years. And of course, the bigger the tear, the more weakness is demonstrated on physical examination findings. Uh, Jay did a great job in going over most of these tests, and I would uh, encourage all of you to review these tests because this is going to be very helpful for you to diagnose these problems in the clinic. I will say that many of the tests can be positive in a painful shoulder, so it's sometimes hard to differentiate. As I teach my residents and fellows and medical students, uh, when you are examining a patient, the one thing you can tell for sure is that somebody has a massive cuff tear because that's when they'll have lag signs. But positive Job tests and positive Near tests and positive Hawkins tests and some of these other tests may be positive and not be indicative of a cuff tear at all. And I always tell patients, I can't tell you for sure if you have a small cuff tear based on physical exam, but I can certainly tell you if you have a massive cuff tear on physical exam alone. And that's really important, I think, for all of us as we're learning how to better differentiate those patients that you're worried about versus those that may just have pain from a uh, inflammatory bursitis. Plain radiographs are critical, as uh, Jay outlined as well. Uh, we're going to see some of the con uh, confounding diagnoses like calcific tendinitis. We'll look for large acromial spurs, as you can see in this patient. But mostly we're looking to see, is the humeral head centered on the glenoid? That's the critical thing. Once we start to see decreased acromial humeral interval, and this is uh, de defined by the top of the humeral head in relation to the closest part of the acromion, if that's less than seven millimeters, then that's associated with rotator cuff disease. 
and of course very important. Now that can be compromised by a type 3 or a hooked acromion, so you have to make sure you look at this so-called um, uh, gothic arch um, that we look at right here, the inframedial border of the scapula and the uh, inframedial border of the humerus, uh, and that should be a smooth arch. Sometimes when trying to get a true AP radiograph, you can get a false positive and look at a humeral head that may look uh, falsely uh, proximally migrated. Make sure you look at the entire radiographic series because you want to see, you, you should see the proximal migration on more than ju just one x-ray view. It's a really important uh, take-home point for there. Arthrograms are rarely indicated, but in cases where a patient cannot get an MRI, that usually means they either have a deep brain stimulator or a defibrillator uh, for cardiac reasons, then an arthrogram or a CT arthrogram can be very helpful. We don't, uh, obviously getting an MRI arthrogram for suspected cuff tears is not our routine, um, but uh, there are some places where I guess that might be something that they may consider. MRI is going to be the gold standard for most centers uh, and most uh, physicians who take care of patients with shoulder problems. Uh, and we're going to look for a number of features on the MRI, uh, namely, uh, is there a tear? That's the first question. How big is the tear? That's the second question. How many muscles are involved? Um, how much retraction is there? And how much muscle atrophy is there? And finally, is there proximal humeral migration? So this is going to be really important to uh, go through a stepwise progression to make those determinations. So what are you looking for? Again, you're looking for where is the tear? As you can see on this uh, coronal T2 MRI um, uh, right here, we see that the uh, tendon is retracted to the medial humeral head. Um, so that's important to understand. And then we look at the atrophy. And again, we see this tremendous atrophy uh, of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, we see that the subscapularis is relatively normal and is often seen in these massive retracted rotator cuff tears, there's relative teres minor hypertrophy because of the lost posterior superior cuff musculature. Uh, on axial images, you're going to look, as Jay said, for medial biceps tendon subluxation for the subscapularis. Really important, and you can see that beautifully right here with the biceps dislocated medially and the subscap completely off the uh, lesser tuberosity uh, insertion. <clears throat> the tangent line has been described uh, showing here, and if you don't see muscle above that tangent line, uh, then you know that there's significant muscle wasting. Now, sometimes this is controversial because, if, as you guys know, as the tendon and muscle unit retract medially, it depends on where that muscle tendon unit is sitting, and so there can be a false positive tangent sign because you may have more muscle than you think if you were to continue to go further medially. So this isn't a drop dead, uh, you know, shouldn't operate because you think you have Goutelier uh, 3 or 4. As I mentioned earlier, there are centers in Europe where they, they will not operate on a cuff tear if they think if there's Goutelier 3 or 4, but a very controversial topic. Uh, MRI sensitivity and specificity in asymptomatic patients 60 years and older, 55% will have a rotator cuff tear. So remember that, uh, really important that it's a very common finding. We always have to correlate it with actual symptoms. <coughs> Excuse me. Ultrasound, as we've mentioned, is incredibly helpful. It can be a great dynamic test. I use it in the office for all my subacromial and glenohumeral injections, um, and it can be great for uh, dynamic testing, looking at bicep subluxation, as Jay showed, looking for subscap tears. Uh, but if you're not f uh, familiar and comfortable with this, uh, then you can have a high false positive and false negative. Uh, so there's a lot of user dependability here, more so than on MRI, and you just have to keep that in mind. Uh, as you're evaluating the literature uh, for both uh, um, ultrasound and MRI comparisons. <clears throat> Sensitivity and specificity, as shown, uh, can be very accurate, uh, but again, uh, this is one of those things where you just have to know uh, your center and know your comfort level. If there's any question at all, sometimes we'll get ultrasound. We have a wonderful musculoskeletal uh, radiologist at Columbia who helps us, uh, but uh, if there's any question, then get an MRI as well to confirm what you think your ultrasound findings are. It's never a bad idea to, uh, to have a belt and suspenders, especially when you're trying to make sure you make the right diagnosis for the patient. <clears throat> 
Uh, treatment for cuff tears, activity and age of the patient are critical. The mechanism of tear, was it a traumatic tear or was it a, a degenerative tear? And obviously the size and all of the associated things that we've been talking about are all going to influence what our decision making. Our non-operative management for the chronic degenerative tear is going to be our first line of defense with therapy, anti-inflammatories and cortisone injections. There are some ongoing recent controversies on giving cortisone injections relative to when you might operate. So it's something to keep in mind as we learn more from a lot of the registry studies that have been done, uh, more specifically with respect to shoulder arthroplasty or hip and knee arthroplasty, but also probably of some concern in thinking about any surgery relative to when we give an injection. Uh, but usually we'll give up to uh, three to four injections per body part per year as a very non-scientific general rule for how I think about cortisone injections. If a patient has no response, uh, then that usually means you either have the wrong diagnosis or you haven't put the medicine in the right spot. So something for us to keep in mind. So here's a, a question. 47-year-old uh, healthy patient has a subacute full thickness supraspinatus tear. Exam shows pain and weakness. There's no instability. We have a type 1 acromion and an MRI showing a, a 2 centimeter full thickness tear without any changes. So Goutelier 0 or 1. A subacromial injection gave good relief, uh, but only 24 hours. And what would be the most appropriate treatment option? So the key points are young age, small tear or medium tear, 2 centimeters, minimal retraction, and no atrophy. So they're really setting this up for somebody that should have a rotator cuff repair sooner rather than later so that they don't go on to progress and become an irreparable tear at some point in the future. Uh, obviously, you can perform this arthroscopic or mini open or open. Uh, the, the, the approach to the repair is actually immaterial. This, in these uh, days, uh, it's rare for residents and fellows in training to see open repairs, although there are some surgeons who still perform it. Uh, but the majority of people do perform these arthroscopically. But there's no proven benefit at this point that arthroscopic is superior to uh, mini open or open, other than with respect to not having to uh, detach the deltoid, which does have some significant advantages. The big question on what to do with articular sided tears or high grade tears has yet to be proven. Uh, you can do an in situ repair if more than 50% of the tendon is intact, uh, or you can release the rest that's intact and do a full thickness uh, repair. This has not been proven one way or the other, so uh, I, this isn't really a test question. I think that could be asked. Post-operatively for cuff repairs, uh, you have to be very slow with the massive tears, uh, and I think that uh, you worry a little bit about re-tearing if you bring if you start the re the uh, rehab too early. Uh, I went in the real practical world. I'd much rather deal with a post-operative stiff shoulder than a post-operative re-tear with a fully mobile shoulder. And if you put it to patients in that perspective and from that standpoint, they usually get it and are uh, fairly compliant. We know that work comp patients always have worse outcomes in any uh, study, in any disease, in any body part, and that's no different in the shoulder. And it's an unfortunate truth. Uh, it's not always because they're malingering. It's often because they are trying to get back to heavy labor positions. But regardless, it is something you have to keep in mind if you're operating on a lot of work comp patients. Mini open repair was uh, once perhaps the gold standard. Uh, this was kind of a combination of an open approach and an arthroscopic approach. Uh, the advantages were that it decreased the risk of deltoid avulsion. But we actually um, uh, had to stretch the deltoid pretty significantly, and it had a higher uh, post-operative stiffness uh, incidents than, than both open or arthroscopic. So uh, mini open uh, doesn't really have a great um, uh, reason to do it. You're probably better off either doing a straight open approach or going straight to the arthroscopic. Uh, figure A shows an arthroscopic picture of a 62-year-old male undergoing repair of a torn subscat. Uh, image, uh, in the image shown, G represents the glenoid, H is the humeral head. The dotted line represents the superlateral border of the subscat and which two ligaments form the structure marked with the asterisk. And you guys should all know what the answer is before we even have to read the answers based on Jay's talk and my talk on the rotator interval. And looking at that um, uh, asterisk, there's the upper border of the subscapular, the supralateral or the so-called comma sign, which is what we look for for retracted subscap tears, is made up of the rotator interval ligaments, the coracohumeral, 
and superior glenohumeral ligaments. So that's going to be asked in a variety of different ways in every test I've ever seen, and it's something that should be a chip shot for all you guys, and hopefully you get that right. Arthroscopic cuff repair, as I mentioned, uh, shows equivalent results to open or mini open, so there's no test question that's going to say which one is superior to others. This is really a matter of, of choice, but in, again, modern uh, orthopedic surgery training, it's more and more rare to see a true open rotator cuff repair. If you're in a place that does it, you should learn that well because it can come, it's a, a technique that should uh, come in good standing for you at some point in your careers. Important concepts are margin convergence. This was actually talked about by Harrison McLaughlin at Columbia way before Dr. Neer, uh, and then popularized by Steve Burkhart from San Antonio uh, in an arthroscopic fashion. Um, an anterior interval slide is releasing the supraspinatus from the rotator interval. This can be really important in uh, chronic retracted tears. And it, before you deem something irreparable, you need to make sure you understand how to get the rotator cuff reduced anatomically. And if you don't understand that, then obviously you might be doing the patient a disservice by not following these steps. So understand an anterior interval slide releasing the supraspinatus, and then a posterior interval slide where we identify the scapular spine, as shown here, and that helps us differentiate the supraspinatus, which will be always anterior to the scapular spine, and the infraspinatus, which is always going to be posterior to the scapular spine. By cutting between that tissue, between the two tendons, we now are doing a posterior interval slide. Have to be careful about this super, uh, uh, suprascapular nerve, which is going to be right in the base of this area. Uh, and you will still see a little jumping of muscle as you get close to that. But this is going to allow you to assess, are these tendons really irreparable or not? And just to put this in perspective, this is going to be the very last part of my releases. After doing subacromial releases, glenohumeral releases, anterior interval slide, it's only about 5% of massive tears where I might have to do a posterior interval slide. Once you have done that, if you cannot repair these tendons to the footprint, then you truly have an irreparable uh, massive cuff tear. You may be able to partially repair the infra in this situation or the supra. More commonly, in my experience, would be the infra. And that can still be very helpful to the patient for restoring the posterior force couple uh, with an intact subscapularis. So this is an important concept uh, before you determine that something is completely irreparable to make sure you go through that stepwise progression uh, to try to get a, uh, a repair. Uh, the subscap repairs, um, this is all, uh, for me now, this is done arthroscopically. Uh, I find it actually much easier to do it arthroscopically than we used to do it open. Uh, you can see the nerve very nicely and obviously you have to take care to, to stay away from the neurovascular structures. Uh, the so-called comma sign we just went over, that's that superlateral margin of the subscapularis, and it's very helpful for identifying that. Uh, whether or not you have to do <coughs> a coracoplasty, as uh, Jay mentioned and discussed, is dependent upon the individual pathology. I do not perform a coracoplasty on most subscap repairs. It's only those that have significant narrowing of that lesser tuberosity uh, coracoid interval as Jay defined, less than seven millimeters that you may consider doing a uh, coracoplasty. Very easy to do, it's not a big deal, but I don't do it routinely unless I find a pathologic reason to do it. You heard a lot about the biceps and so I won't uh, uh, belabor that. Uh, which of the following statements regarding rotator cuff repair is true? And you can see the options here, and this is related to vascularity. So this is the whole concept of drilling and getting blood supply. Steve uh, Snyder from Van Nuys, California has uh, coined the term the uh, duvet uh, blanket, and that's where you uh, create little vascular channels in the tuberosity to enhance and encourage healing of the tendon. It's the original PRP before there was ever such a fancy word or fancy uh, technique. And so some form of enhancing the vascular supply can be very helpful to try to encourage healing. Remember, we're dealing with an avascular tendon in an atrophic situation with a uh, atrophic bone. So it perhaps is the worst healing milieu that you could possibly hope for, and we're trying to get that very uh, unfavorable scenario, trying to get a tendon to heal to the bone. And that's why there's so much attention now in biologic enhancement for rotator cuff disease.
as far as arthroscopic cuff repair goes, again, we're trying to get an anatomic restoration of the tendon to the bone. And there's lots of discussion about the types of repairs, single row and double row. Uh, at this point in time, what we do know uh, is that at least biomechanically, a double row is superior to a single row. But then in most clinical scenarios, there's been a hard time actually uh, showing uh, definitively that a double row leads to increased healing. There's a couple of studies more recently that suggest that, uh, but at least in the early period of double row versus single row controversy, uh, we really had a hard time showing that there was improved healing. Uh, so it remains a controversial discussion. Uh, following open pectoralis major transfer for a chronic subscap insufficiency, which of the following would most likely show weakness if an iatrogenic nerve injury occurred during the pec transfer. Remember, this is typically a subcoracoid pectoralis major transfer, and that's going to help you understand the anatomy and the right answer to this question, because the right answer is elbow flexion, because during that subscap, during that subcoracoid transfer, the musculocutaneous nerve is at significant risk, and injuring the nerve would lead to weakness in elbow flexion. So again, an important concept for us to understand the anatomy. Uh, it's the basis for everything we do in orthopedics. And as I like to always think about, the applied anatomy is kind of what we do on a daily basis, whether we're in the office seeing patients or whether you're in the operating room. Tendon transfers are, are becoming more and more rare because of the advent of arthroscopic uh, techniques, partial repairs, superior capsule reconstructions, the uh, balloon spacer, again, an experimental, currently FDA uh, trial option being used in Israel and Europe, uh, and the uh, reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. That being said, tendon transfers can be a very uh, outstanding uh, option and have been used historically uh, for massive irreparable tears in the young athlete, or the young patient, excuse me, uh, who has an intact subscapularis and is too young for any uh, in at least uh, reverse shoulder replacement uh, historically. Here's a patient of mine who fit that criteria. This is a latissimus transfer in a 44-year-old patient. I have to I'd obviously be concerned about both axillary and radial nerves, both of which have been uh, historically talked about as potential complications uh, with this transfer. We often, when I do a latissimus transfer, I take the teres major as well because, as you can see, the latissimus is a long, thin tendon, and I like to uh, use that to repair the super, or to replace the supraspinatus, whereas the teres major, which is shorter but much broader, can come to the posterior tuberosity and serve as an external rotator for the uh, lost infraspinatus. So that's my go-to transfer for posterior superior cuff tears, although there's current in interest in other transfers. Uh, we just lost our screen and we have our um, uh, the chat room that came up, so hopefully we'll get rid of that in a second. There we go. Um, but there are other options like the uh, triceps, um, and um, uh, and the uh, um, uh, triceps is a, another uh, current uh, tendon transfer, uh, and trapezius, lower trapezius, has uh, been uh, mentioned also by the Mayo Group uh, as another tendon transfer of choice. So this remains a topic of interest, and there isn't a right or wrong answer here. Pec major transfer is going to be the transfer of choice for chronic subscap tears. We just talked about the test question for that. Uh, I will say that it's one of the more disappointing uh, transfers that we perform, and while it's talked about as the best test answer in real life when you're doing this, unfortunately, doesn't lead to very reproducible results. Uh, we've talked about the latissimus transfer uh, and other options for posterior superior cuff tears. Biologic and synthetic grafts are increasing uh, in use. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, xenografts have uh, been a problem uh, historically. We have uh, newer options now. Allograft is being used uh, fairly significantly. And there's uh, uh, acellular bovine collagen scaffolds that are now being, uh, that are commercially available that can be used for partial thickness tears and for augmentation of tears. Um, and so those are things to keep an eye, uh, an eye on because there's no question that uh, some form of biologic augmentation is critically important for us when we're talking about trying to enhance rotator cuff uh, repairs uh, healing. Here's an active 68-year-old woman has undergone an uncomplicated cuff repair with a double row construct, so the strongest biomechanical uh, repair 
using a biocomposite knotless anchors. At two-month follow-up, she's known to have increased shoulder pain, weakness, and limited motion. Uh, images reveal a failure of the repair. What's the most likely mechanism of failure? It's also critical in this question that the repair, the failure happened within two months, and we know from most of the literature, failures happen within the first four months. So this is a very common clinical finding that's being uh, uh, used as a test question, and this is usually due to suture pullout from the repaired tissue. So it's the tissue quality that's the problem. Uh, we know that there's so-called type 2 tears. That's an um, actual byproduct of the double row suture bridge construct where we get a, a vascular, almost a strangulation, it's felt perhaps, where the tendon repair at the footprint heals, but the uh, tendon the, uh, fails at the muscle tendon junction, so-called type 2 repair, or type 2 tear, excuse me, and something to keep in mind. And again, remains a, a interest of interest as to what we should be doing clinically, and that remains controversial. Uh, repair failure, as we've just been talking about, is failure of the cuff tissue to heal. What are the factors that increase that risk? Uh, patient age greater than 65, large and massive tears, significant muscle atrophy, diabetes and smoking, uh, significant retraction where we've done heroic things, as I showed earlier, to get the tendons back to the footprint. Uh, poor compliance with the post-op protocol. Please don't blame your patients. It's a bad, uh, it's bad form to, for surgeons to blame their patients because it's rarely their fault. It's usually either uh, bad luck or uh, often it may be our own fault with uh, what we haven't uh, um, communicated to the patient. Um, so I think it's an important uh, point to just keep in mind. Uh, here's a good example of a patient who's undergone a double row repair. And you can see the post-operative MRI uh, four months after the surgery, proximal migration, retraction of the tendon uh, to the medial humeral head. You can see the artifact from the previous anchors. Uh, and uh, this is a real problem that we see, unfortunately, all too often uh, with our patients. Uh, deltoid detachment, of course, a complication with open, but not just with open approach. So don't fool yourself. You can detach the, the deltoid if you have an overly aggressive arthroscopic acromioplasty and you're not paying attention to that deltoid periosteum uh, at the anterior aspect of the acromion. So I've certainly seen a number of patients over the years referred to me with deltoid dehiscence from an arthroscopic acromioplasty. So please don't take that for granted. Suprascapular nerve injury, very rare. Uh, infection, thank goodness, is a very, uh, a very rare incidence. P. acnes is the most commonly implicated organism, something we wrote about a long time ago is still written about today, so keep that in mind. As you recall, you have to keep your cultures for at least 14 days until their laboratory, uh, because otherwise you might miss the P. acnes growth. Um, so some people say 17 days, but somewhere between 14 and 21 days is what's, what most literature now supports. Uh, stiffness, again, less common, but there's evidence from Evan Flato's group at Mount Sinai that stiffness actually leads to healing rotator cuff repairs, so I never am fearful of a stiff post-op shoulder, uh, as I mentioned, and rarely, rarely pneumothorax has been reported as a possible complication, so keep that in mind. <coughs> Excuse me. 45-year-old patient uh, presents with pain and swelling after a cuff repair 10 weeks ago. Physical exam shows the portals are healed, there's no drainage. Testing shows uh, that the cuff is limited secondary to pain, has white count and a sed rate CRP as shown. Aspiration is completed and no organisms are seen on the gram stain. 12 days after the aspiration, positive cultures are reported, which organism, organism is most likely to have grown, and that's a classic propionobacter acnes uh, story. So very common, as we said, keep it for 14 to 21 days and that'll usually let it uh, grow. Here's a 61-year-old male, had a revision cuff repair. Anesthesia is given by an ultrasound-guided block with good effect. The surgery itself is uneventful. In the recovery room, patient has no pain, but is having right-sided inspiratory chest pain as well as difficulty breathing. On room air, we've got hypoxia. Chest x-ray is shown. You guys can figure out where this question is heading, hopefully. Uh, and this shows a pneumothorax, and that's uh, associated with a significant uh, uh, smoking history. So very rare complication. I can't imagine you're going to see it asked a lot, although uh, Derek would show, tell us it's been asked 36 times. So there you go. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.